awkward button. Stuck okay, bridges. so this Stuck is our 39th week of the Stockbridge Library online poetry series. And our the president of the Board of Our Trusted Trustees, excuse me, John Gillespie, came up with this idea last April to have a little poetry during Poetry Month. And here we are almost a year later, still going strong. We've had a variety of poets reading with us from all over the country um, and even abroad. And today we are very happy to have you, Adam Davis, with us. Um, Adam was born in Arizona and grew up in various places, France, New Jersey, Scotland, and Utah. And his debut poetry collection, Index of Haunted Houses, is a winner of the Catherine A. Morton Prize, and that was published in 2020. His poems have appeared in The Believer, Boston Review, Gulf Coast, The Paris Review, The Southern Review, and a series of Z's and Y's and B's and A's that represent a journal that I am not familiar with, so forgive me. Um, and Adam is joining us today from San Diego, where he teaches English literature at the Bishop's School. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to you, John, and to you, Adam. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Thank you. So Adam, we, we, bring, uh, we begin each, each uh, program asking a few questions so the, uh, the audience can get to know you as a, a poet in your creative process. So how have the themes of 2020, obviously politics, uh, yes. racial, racial inequality, income inequality, uh, even 2021, the, the January 6th Capitol event, now impeachment 2.0, ha have those issues, I guess, I guess, found their way into uh, some, of, some of your work? Not so far, although I'm, I'm hopeful that they will. I think that... Uh... You know, I, I work on a little bit of a time delay, and and certainly I think I've been experiencing what what many people have uh, over the last year. Um, you know, I'm a teacher, so I've been teaching remotely from home since last March. Uh, so it's been 11 months of, uh, of at home teaching, and um, there's a kind of fatigue that sets in as a result of being in front of the screen all the time. Um, so I, I haven't been writing as much as I want to. Um, you know, my process though is fairly accumulative. So I'll do a lot of free writing um, and then return to that work, you know, days, weeks, or months later, sometimes years later, and, and start mining that for material. Um, so I have been been keeping kind of a, I guess I call it like a poetry journal on some level. Um, and, and I hope to return to that at some point in the near future where I can start digging through that and, and, uh, and kind of uncovering, um, you know, my, my emotional and psychological responses to this time in the work. Mm -hmm. We talked earlier, so we know the, uh, you know, the post-event lonely room and a glass of bourbon is a poem <laughs> that'll be be started soon after after this session ends. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but seriously, you know, I love the I love the poetry journal. You know, we've heard different things from people. So how does how does a poem start for you? How does how does it is is it. Uh, you know, you're going through the journal or you hear some conversation with someone. I just wondered how it all, you know, how it mostly starts. You know, it, it's interesting. I think it's changed somewhat over the years just because my lifestyle, you know, uh, I have two young girls. Um, my lifestyle's changed, uh, you know, effectively. Um, I have less time to write. So I think before it would have been more, uh, I'd wait for the inspiration. It would be a line that I would hear on the street. There would be something that would pop into my head. And now I, I find that I really have to, um, to have a, a not necessarily a strict schedule, but a kind of uh, ritual and, and a dedication to uh, to getting to the page. For me, the poems always start with a language. Um, I'm a very uh, sonically focused, I guess I would say, poet. So I'm always looking uh, to explore uh, interesting phrases, interesting sounds, um, the ways in which language can be kind of, uh, you know, bent or, or melted on some level. Um, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I lived for three years in France when I was uh, when I was a child, so I was able to learn French. So that second language has, has also uh, opened up different possibilities for me. I think in it, because of moving around so much, I was often um, attempting to 
understand uh, language without perhaps knowing what that language meant. And so a lot of my process is recording and listening and then kind of it's like a, like a, a biofeedback, I guess, uh, approach to, uh, to writing in that way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've learned over the many weeks that, you know, a poem is never done. It's just resting, you know, on the side of the desk, mm -hmm. very likely for another, another potential review. Yeah. So when you're putting together a publication uh, and you're, you know, how do, how do you, you know, how does a poem close out for you? That's, that's another excellent question. Um, I think there's, there's, uh, I think they're, they're, you know, for me, it, it's interesting because having the book published, there's still poems in there that even though they are in their, in their final version, in reading them aloud, I notice that I make certain changes to them. Um, you know, a poem for me feels finished uh, when I can read it or imagine reading it in front of people without fear of embarrassment on some level. <laughs> there, is a, there, there is a question there as to whether or not I can stand behind every word, every uh, punctuation mark. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I tell this to my students a lot too, that, you know, you can't hide with poetry. Well, you know, prose is wonderful, but you have blankets of, of, of words to hide behind and, and kind of obfuscate, you know, what you might be uh, interested in. With poetry, you really have to own every single word in there. You have to be able to explain why there's a comma instead of a semicolon or an M dash. You have to explain why you selected this particular word. And so, um, and so for me, it's really, it's, you know, it, it's, I guess, an acid test or a Pepsi challenge or something like that. But you have to be able to, for me, present the work and feel like it, it stands on its own, that it would be something that you um, feels honest, I guess, emotionally honest to you. Well, that's great. And a uh, little note, I'll find the article. There was an article in the New York Times about the semicolon uh, this, this week. And someone wrote a book about the semicolon Love that, yeah. yeah, it was very intriguing. I don't know. It's like, like I don't know, three or four hundred words. Anyway, anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll find it and send it to you. You'll love that. Thank you. You'll enjoy it. So absolutely. Yeah. So let's uh, let's uh, you know hear some of the uh, you know what you want to read today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, um, I figure I'll read from uh, from the index here. This is uh, this this book uh, Index of Haunted Houses. It came out in September last year from Saraband Books. It took me. 13 years, um, basically from beginning to, uh, to, to eventual publication. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of history in this book here. And it, the, the central conceit, I guess, if you could call it that, of the book is uh, investigating the, the very American notion of possession and what that word means, both in the ways we use it for uh, supernatural and for capital. And so this book, in many ways, is interested in uh, in how we uh, we use both uh, you know common language and corporatized language to express the economic and historical anxieties of our time as as contemporary Americans, um, and to uh, you know to give you a little bit of example of that, there's uh, there's a bit of an obsession here with analog technologies, and I'll start off. The first poem in the book is called the Bell System. And it uh, refers to Mary, Jane, and Pat, who those are the first names of the women whose voices were used for the Bell Systems automated uh, telephone system. So back in the day when you'd call up uh, and uh, you'd call, dial a number and the number would not go through, you'd get that doo doo doo, you know, that little dial tone. And you'd get this lovely, uh, you know, very peaceful female voice telling you that the person you're looking for is no longer there. And um, that, that always haunted me as a child. And I think it became even more potent when, um, you know, the, the subprime mortgage crisis happened when the Great Recession happened back in uh, 2008, 2009. Um, and you had, you know, particularly in Southern California, swaths of brand new uh, housing developments go abandoned in that way. And you didn't necessarily know where the people went. So I thought there was something particularly American about a very kind and gentle voice telling you that the people you're looking for are, are no longer there. Um, and so this is the bell system. And Mary Jane and Pat, they function in some ways as a Greek chorus or a spirit guide uh, throughout the book. The bell system. Good night, Mary Jane, Pat. Sleep tight, you sweet operators of America. 
Your voices strung like laundry across this nation drowsy with a full century's worth of light. There's nothing you can't tell me that I haven't already heard gift wrapped in your general American grace. But still I wonder in what chamber of a horse's ant-eaten skull I'll recover my youth. Our human garden grows rich in these green suburbs and what I feel is not so much loss as a lessening, as if the self was nothing more than a late model sedan crossing the city limit in search of a better resale value. It's funny, this franchise of molecules that fizzes up in each of us, like motels viral along the interstate, some full while others flicker and die. When will the stars rain down like cheap plaster? When will language be little more than a dandruff shaken from our heads? Ladies, you tell me the number I've been calling has been disconnected, but where did the person it belonged to go? Alone on the line, I find only a prairie, alive with funneled wind, a nation heavy with wheat and light. Its chorus of dim voices locked in a kind of pharmaceutical sleep, I find a system unchanged, charged with electrical pulses that send the receiver scurrying in their cradle. The longhand breath of ghosts rising through switchboards to ask, who's there? Well, tell me, who is there? Who goes? Ladies, please wake up. I want to try again. Hmm. Thank you. Um, we, got, we got a clapping hand. Oh, there, there we go. All right. Here we go. 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 I'll, I'll just quit there. We'll move. We'll move. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, when, well, yeah, once you hit a home run, you're done. You're done. That's it. That's it. You got to walk off there. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. This next one. This next one is uh, is called Nebraskan Bribes. Not once in a river, yet a rapid run of reckless mouths gnash their way through the alphabet's many motorways. The crowd faces like hot doldrums, or sorry, faces like hot dominoes in doldrums. Their destiny too dense to parse, too dear to describe, is in denial. Give them this day before they chew even the scenery, before they crush the shunts that keep the sky in its place and squash the sarsaparilla tufts of cloud that congeal at the eye's very edges. Give them the blood, the bread, the ghost, the salty tines of Satan's seasick fork. It's hot. Open a window or something. I feel the heat of a holy oven upon my household. To care is to sometimes kill, as we have sometimes been told. To care is to carve the image of our caretaker into this idle tree and border crossing. Under how many watts must this age be broiled? Douse me in better water for brisker belief. Do this in remembrance of our impractical head and heads, our illiterate heart and hearts. This next poem, um, it's something of a, of a mathematical poem, I guess you could say. The conceit was that uh, I, I wanted to work with some notion of addition, which as an English teacher and a poet is, uh, addition is about all I can manage. Um, I'm functionally illiterate when it comes to math as many of my students would attest. So hence why I teach English. Uh, spirit arithmetic. Yeah, good. <laughs> One nick, two nick goals, three licorice twists before bedtime. Four hours of a leaky faucet. Five times, five times now. Six spoons I swallow, seven scratches upon the sun. Eight elms invisible to the eye. Nine knots in a blonde braid. Ten attics in this house. In this one we store strangers. Well, Adam, I'm I'm uh, I'm a CFO, so if you get into math trouble, <laughs> I'm the math guy. I'm the math, uh, yeah. Actually, can you do taxes as well? Because the season's coming. Yeah, someone in our group does taxes. So, uh, <laughs> you could, you could uh, consider me the math mako guy. And I'll that would be a tender, I mean, a bumper, a spreadsheet. You know. Oh man, I mean, speaking of good business deals, you know, uh, an accountant for poets, we might need that. You know, tax tax uh, helps. Uh, if we could get a, an offshore account in the Caymans or something like that. Yeah, for, uh, yeah, poetry, yeah, offshore poetry proceeds. 
There we yeah, go. Well, yeah, the, uh, yeah, we'll go public on Wall Street. Poetry, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let, let's get the Reddit forums behind us. We might make a killing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> there's another theme. There's another, yeah. I That's tell you, it. Every time I think there's, there, you know, there's going to be a quiet week, something yeah. explodes. Oh, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, off the internet or, or a newspaper or something else. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, I think GameStop's probably going to go out of business after this, by the way. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Well, that, well, I guess, you know, Blockbuster and uh, AMC and Bed Bath and Beyond, we got the whole, uh, the whole roster of these old, uh, kind of more analog businesses, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess uh, uh, we'll, we'll make a segue out of that, I guess. I've got a number of poems, as you would expect for a book called uh, Index of Haunted Houses. There are a number of poems in here that uh, have haunted house in their title, and uh, they have specific dates attached to them, which are both as uh, specific and, and arbitrary as you might imagine. I'll keep the origins of their uh, reasoning uh, mysterious um, in some ways. But uh, this first poem, and there's three of these I'll read, uh, Haunted House 1780. In August, the sun held a coin to the silver berries. They ripened to cake among the gunshot, among the wounded with their piecemeal apples and parchment lips. Big houses rose bright as besants from the soup bones of that bayou. In the cellars of the earth, gandy dancers danced, singing, gulp what the fountain gives, give this in return. Haunted House, 1978. The fuse is a medicine bank, an arc of home remedies. The buttons crumble like aspirin, taste like tonic water washed down with lime. There was a time when life clung like crime to this place, but we had a cure for that. Haunted house, not 1980. Don't you know the body is a fire that sings at night? Our organs, stars that winter in Western states, look at us, look at us solemn astronauts, us ants smashed under the sun's question, us symphonies of coin and skull. Everything is new, isn't it? Yes, everything is new. Everything is new until it's told. This next poem is a, a poem in 17 parts, and it takes its inspiration and some of its language from 19th century American board games. Um, you know, because of course, if we're, if we're going to talk about America, we have to talk at some point about Monopoly. And, uh, and, and so that's, uh, that's what we have here. It's called National Anthem. One, locusts eat Ohio alive. June is the first month in bank robbery season. Silky tornado nestles in the trash. Angles of neckties act as compasses for flight. Two, you will disappear. Three, you will feel the need to disappear. Four, in an abandoned lot, a slow conglomerate of green tongues devour a dead bird. Five, fill in the blank. This new century sky is A, noctilucent, B, nacreous, C, lenticular, D, unidentifiable as fluoride, E, all of the above. Six, the sky is a cinder block smashed by hydrogen and moth light. Seven, wreckage is a kind of question. It asks you to reconsider your inventory. Eight, broken jackknife, decoder ring, come back. Milk white set of marbles, come back. Boiled shark jaw, sloop load of clams, antique copper brooch, please come back. This wristwatch won't tick, won't heirloom, but disappoint. Nine, in its abandoned lot, the dead bird is gone. Green tongues twist slowly. Memory, a thing that devours things that will devour things. 10. Spare licks of lightning pepper the pan handle. Trees, 
teeth in a locust zone. 11, come back. 12, construction workers wear federal orange vests, smoke cigarettes in the noon haze as they undo the street's ceiling. Cars run on boiled bones. Smog rolls in like a prehistoric ghost to slumber. At night, our cities are swallowed in swamps of orange light. Ghosts, federal as bone, boil around us. 13. According to local sources, a well-kept lawn is the simplest indicator of economic stability. Also, burglars operate under the night's braille blanket. Conversation is a politic of trivia. A newspaper is a politic of a tree. 14. In the beginning, atoms collided like German consonants. Everything else stewed in the oil fields of Los Angeles. 15. And ghosts, federal as bone, boil still around us. 16. Already heat has broke loose of its zoo. Children chew tar, kick cans, call strangers, collect. They drown the radio man in his radio. 17. Come back. Come back, children. Come back and see the Midwest checkerboard from 30,000 feet. The smoke of industry leering like syrup over the river, alming the sky of life. All right, let's see here. Um, how about, I'm gonna read two poems now that are, to me at least, specifically American ghost stories. Um, the first one refers to Phineas Gage, who if you're like me and took a psychology class in high school, you learned about him. He was that famous Vermont, uh, he was a Gandhi dancer actually, who was someone who set the rails on the railroad. And as he was, setting the rails, um, they had to use dynamite and this dynamite drove a lead, uh, the, his tamping um, iron uh, through his head. So it went down under the chin and then straight out the top of his head. And um, miraculously he survived. And not only did he survive, but he, um, he was somewhat, I, I guess we would argue he was fully functional for the remainder of his life. Although his character changed dramatically in the aftermath of that event. And he became, um, in some ways, uh, you know, one of our first celebrities. He actually uh, toured the country with the iron tamping rod uh, for many years. You can find some really fascinating uh, daguerreotypes of him online with him holding this, uh, this rod that he became very uh, close to over the years. Um, so that's the first poem I'm gonna read. And then the second one refers to uh, both Edison and Westinghouse and uh, the Cuyahoga River. Um, Edison, <laughs> Edison and Westinghouse um, were embroiled in that currency war at the beginning of the century uh, where they were trying to prove which uh, version, whether it was DC uh, for uh, Edison or alternating current for Westinghouse was more efficient and thereby could you know, become a, make a better profit. Um, Edison was a much savvier businessman than Westinghouse. And so when William Kimmler was, uh, who I believe uh, killed his wife uh, with an ax, um, when he was put on trial, um, Edison said that he wanted to uh, basically prove that alternating current was the most dangerous type of current by electrocuting Kimmler. Kimmler became the first uh, victim of the uh, electric chair. And Westinghouse actually supported Kimmler's defense because he was trying so hard to not have his alternating current used for the chair. He, of course, failed. And, um, and what we had was uh, known in, at least in Sing Sing, I think, is, uh, is old Sparky, um, the, the electric chair. Uh, and the Cuyahoga River, of course, was uh, so famously polluted that it caught fire, I believe, 13 times in the 20th century, which eventually led to the creation of the EPA. So this is the first poem, Ghost Story 1848. You are a spy in the rain that falls in your head. You have become a different person and will never know why. Will you never know? 
Will you never know why the weather is a borrowed room in which you record the commands you will not follow? When it grows cold, you chatter like a telegraph. And this is the second poem about the currency war. Eastern Standard Time, 1890. Winter's cognitive attic leaves trees like wishbones. They wince when the wind winds up along these lonely stretches of calico wilderness. Edison is our only confirmation saint. Westinghouse watches Lake Erie burn. A bell rings out for baptisms. Another is rung for the baptized. A third announces a moment of silence for all those who chose such a time to profess their flame-proof faith. If you listen closely, you can hear their ashes ask amnesty for the wind. Remembrance is the only act of significance. We fall asleep by the radio to dream of the air raids like our fathers before us. So Adam, I think there's a, uh, uh, George Westinghouse had an installation down on Great Barrington okay. uh, by the Housatonic River where he, he lit up some streets with streetlights back in uh, 1887. Yeah, there's, there's a plaque down there. And I mean, you can't, you can't really see what, it, what he did, but there's a right. historical, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's such an interesting moment in American history that it's, you know, kind of the war to, uh, to power America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's 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 invent the electric chair to see if our our, our project works the right way. <laughs> I, well, you know, wasn't there? I mean, that's because wasn't uh, I think it was at Coney Island there was a rogue elephant that broke lo loose of a circus and, and killed a number of people, and then Edison electrocuted it. I think there's there's actually footage of it. It was filmed. Um, you know, it, it, it's yeah, it, it's amazing in the ways in which, you know, the, these benefits to society are so quickly torn towards uh, or weaponized, I guess, <laughs> against society that no way too. Yeah, well, welcome to the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there you go. That's, uh, that's something there. Um, let me read a few more here. Uh, this next one's called Spirit of Black Tuesday. The sun spies on me through the keyhole. Nettle boned and bereft, I eat money like bread. The light socket has two faces that represent one emotion. I incur wrath like an Incan mask. Mister, give me your blurry coat of caffeine. Promise a moat of molasses to drink. Shine these shoes to knives. Sell me back my piggy bank. Let's, let's check back in with Mary Jane and Pat. Um, I should mention too that, you know, in, in part of the book's uh, obsession with analog technologies is that uh, in, in um, I guess in some kind of promotion for the book, I ended up creating a, uh, a, a hotline uh, for the book that you can dial into. It's an automated hotline that uh, if you dial the number, you can then bring up, uh, you get a series of touch tone menus that you can press the buttons and you get different stories and uh, different poems and things like that. So uh, if you wanna dial 619-329-5757, um, you can find it on my website too. Uh, and you want to pass a few hours the old fashioned way with just a voice on the end of a, a telephone connection. Uh, try it out, see what you think. It's, uh, I had fun making it. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Yeah. Great. This is Ghosts of the Bell System. Ringing, ringing. Mary, Jane, Pat, rooms everywhere are ringing. Rattan furniture is rotting along with my breakfast. Ladies, my morning bowl of cereal and glass of orange juice, ringing. Children at play are ringing and the cars that confront them are ringing, are slowing to observe their ringing, are thinking of the reclining chairs that await them in the junkyard, in the locus of all rot, where everything is rotten, everything rotting, ladies, Everything is ringing as you always said it would. But I didn't know then. I didn't listen. I knew neither of rot nor ringing. And now your words aren't ringing. They sustain pitch. They arc like swans in my cochlea's cul-de-sac. They nest there. And I ask you, ladies, please, for three more minutes sleep. Hmm. I think... Um, 
you know, to your, to your question earlier, John, um, I might I might read two newer poems. Um, you know, th this book took, a, a you know, as I said, about 13 years from inception to publication. So um, maybe I'll read two newer poems here that, that uh, I don't know if they'll, I mean, I, th I think actually they will. Maybe they, they pre-vision, pre-envision. I'm always haunted by how prescient poems seem. Um, they seem to, to telegraph events that are years away. And this, this is one called Anthropocene Cool, which, uh, Obviously, given the title, we live in the Anthropocene, and um, the the pandemic we now live in is uh, is an an Anthropocene phenomenon, I guess, in that sense. You know, the uh, our our uh, it's our struggle with the uh, you know environmentalism and, and the protection of the environment, and what indeed might happen when uh, you know we move too far into areas that perhaps we shouldn't, and then unleash. Uh, uh, you know, various bugs that we were not formally accustomed to. But this is called Anthropocene Cool. Tell me what you deserve, and I'll give it at my expense. Give me enough string, and I'll twine your desire to its fruit, so long as its fruit is me. Otherwise, go indigent and handsome on your road. Go crimson and unpronounceable. Your cosmology, porcine and gasket, your grief and incandescent cancer that conjugates all joy into loss. Your congregation curtained as a circus must be to protect its prophets from payless eyes. Likewise, we're curtailed by pretension, unappreciated by everything from Maharaja to Messiah, mulberry bush to song about it. We wander grass-fed boutiques of just of animals like Victorian pensioners, twirling umbrellas and in lace, calling the lion old-fashioned, long in tooth. Nostalgia confers narcissism like a tree. So we sit in the audience of that circus, suspect and brigand, like a magazine so estranged from its congressman that it falls out of circulation. So we smile and show the barcode of our teeth. So we run, so we run, blown out like a bride on the beach, all bluster and white, the sky armored with birds and secular as a tomb given to tourism. Cool. Let's see here, I'll read, uh, I'll read two more poems. I'll read one more new one and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish off with one of the, uh, the longer poems in the book. Um, this next poem is, probably the, the newest thing, uh, newest thing, newest poem. I should give it some kind of respect there. And it's not just a thing. It's, uh, <laughs> although what did, uh, what did, what did William Carlos Williams say? Poems are, th are machines made out of words. I guess that that would be a thing, right? Um, and this one, as its inspiration, it actually, uh, I was lucky enough uh, at my school to have Harriet Mullen, who is one of the, just uh, really our, our our titanic forces in, in contemporary poetry come read. And uh, she's heavily influenced by the Ulipo who are this French group or are this French group of literary theorists who use mathematical formulas to create new literature. Um, one of their most famous uh, members is Italo Calvino. So if you've read Invisible Cities or uh, If Upon a Winter's Night, A Traveler, um, he uses lots of interesting uh, mathematical uh, exercises to create literature. Um, Georges Perec was another famous French uh, practitioner and he wrote a book called Avoid, which uh, was a, I believe a 40,000 or 50,000 word long novel uh, that did not feature the letter E. So it's all about creating constraints to force yourself into a corner that you then have to find your way out of, which for me is wonderful because I think that's the entire uh, goal of, of poetry. We're, we're placing ourselves into these very difficult uh, kind of escape rooms of language and then trying to find our way out. Um, so for this, um, for this poem, I used a, an exercise which is called an analytical dictionary definition. And you take a, a, a name, in this case it was Harriet Mullen's name, and then it's almost like an, an acrostic. So for, you know, for Harriet and, and then Mullen, I would then write a word down. So a, a word down for H and then A and then R and then R and then E. Uh, am I spelling this right? I, I'm, I'm losing my spelling here, but that's it. So, and then you go across with more words until you end up with this huge, 
I guess, raft, we would say, of, of words. And then it's up to you to find the connective tissue between them. And um, I ended up using that to write her introduction. And afterwards, my department chair approached me and said, you really need to turn that into a poem. And, uh, and I did, and, and that's what happened. Um, and, and here it is, it's called My IRS. I am two vowels strung 20 years long. My life a ransom letter written by a cardiogram, tympanic as traffic and lights of traffic that renew the tercets of Esso stations, standing violent as macaws in the eulative night. I need lithium or language, nurse. I need words to fall like ricin from an envelope. Clearly, my synapses need seeing to. So please, repo the verb of me. Conduct me swiftly through the conjunction of Tennessee where nouns loiter like limbs, languid with quaaludes, where daylight breaks like a mouthful of fentanyl over the teeth of a country that cares not for such news. Should a poem be the pill or the pharmacy? Should I pledge myself to this business as if it were Jared Manley Hopkins or Jesus Christ? Here I am, Lord, earnest as a rice cooker, lively as Superman in his leotard, my spiritual fizz empirical as Pepsi and just as cheap. Jesus, Gerard, who will irrigate these ears from error? Who will whisper that in the empire of swans, the black signet is Elvis? All around me, the malady of my unmaking unmans me. Roadside trash, unrecycled recyclables, my shadow laid like a new suit over the bus bench and birds behind it. All this urban tumbleweed, all these words for worse. When whoever's kingdom it is comes calling for it, will the last televangelist of grammar go angled like an angel in the direction of their god? Or will America just eat my opioids as like Nemo it poisons its seas to peace? When I was a verb, I thought as a verb, so I did as a verb, just like the police. Tonight, the moon slouches in its straight jacket of stars. There's a multinational wind afoot, some merry beast loose, all pronoun without surcease. What rookie woods will it rouse first? What islands will it make of our bodies yet? It wasn't Hopkins, the Jesuit, that... Uh... You wrote a bunch of stuff and basically destroyed most of his work until he decided to, to have a few written down. It, well, that, that was it. He, had, he was, so he was a Jesuit um, and um, he, I don't believe he destroyed his work, but he kept it in a trunk. It wasn't discovered until after his death. Uh, yeah, by his yeah, yeah. But I mean, he was, I, I, I adore his work, um, I, you know, and you may hear that in some of the sonics um, because his, for, for living such a, um, a closeted experience in some ways, um, because he was gay as well and, and, and really living, um, tr wrestling with the question of his sexuality and then also his devotion to God. Um, and, and he felt so deeply that um, his, his poetry was an affront to God. It was something that distracted him from it, that every poem became basically a prayer begging God to let him write. Um, but yeah, he's a genius, absolute genius work. Um, and, and madness for you know the era that it came out in. Yeah, didn't he? Uh, didn't he have all those words that were basically, if you pronounced it all, it would be almost like operatic. Just it is, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the dappled. I think had people used dappled before him, and the uh, uh, like shining on shook foil. I always remember that one. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 very difficult to read it aloud. It usually yep. takes you, you know, because part of it is there are so many syllables or almost like words that are crashing into each other, like surf, that it's yep. tough to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It's like a congress of symbols, really, right? Like they're just crashing again and again. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's beautiful work, though. But yeah, I mean, it, it's so haunting to think that, you know, you know, he was so talented and, and, and that he couldn't reconcile what I hope he would have looked at as a God given gift, um, you know, into, into something else. But, uh, you know, that's, it's such an interesting idea, the idea of, um, of poetry as, as prayer in, in some ways, which, you know, yeah. it's an incantatory thing. Um, yeah. You know, there's a ritualistic nature to it. So I'll read, um, I think we have time, I'll read one more poem. It's the, it's the longest poem in the book. And uh, it's, uh, it's in six parts. And uh, it's called Stetson in Retrograde. And it takes its epigraph 
from a very famous law case called uh, Stambovsky versus Ackley, uh, which is better known if you go to law school. I have not gone to law school. I, um, I don't know if I can recommend it or not, but if you do go, you will probably encounter the Ghostbusters ruling. And it was effectively the first time that the law gave the paranormal legal standing. And the, the background behind this was in the early 90s, I believe in, in New York, uh, a gentleman bought a house and he was told by neither the owners nor the real estate agent that this house was considered to be haunted. Now he himself did not believe in ghosts, but he did believe in a, a better resale value. And so he was uh, horrified to learn that he picked up this house that had this kind of supernatural baggage. And so he took the, uh, the other family to court for a rescission. He wanted his money back and the court sided with him. And they basically said that, you know what, uh, according to the law that ghosts exist. And, uh, and even if you aren't a lawyer, you should go and read this text. It's full of these great spooky uh, double entendres. Clearly the judges were having a lot of fun with this. They make references to Hamlet, um, to the Amityville, Amityville horror, all these great things. So I, um, I took that, uh, that quote to heart and, um, and in doing so, I ended up writing this poem, which uh, this one is really a book within a book. It's, it's a reflection and, and kind of a refraction of all the themes that are already present. And the way that I wrote this was I actually, I went through the book itself. This was the last poem I wrote for the book. I went through the book and I, for each poem in there, I just wrote one line. I tried to, to condense everything, every poem into one line. And then I took those lines and I put them together. And then I started playing with them and moving them around and seeing what worked. And uh, so what I ended up with is this longer series of, of hypotheticals. It's called Stetson and Retrograde. As a matter of law, the house is haunted. Stambovsky versus Ackley, 1991. One. If a house is haunted like a radio is haunted, if a body is a radio of blood, if a body of ghosts hums like blood over a valley of bone, if blood is a government of ghosts, if bones grow green as cash in the foreign national of our ghosts, if homes bloom along the interstate of our blood, if from granaries of bone we rise in the newspaper dawn, if amongst the chattering of water we rise like a benediction over the auspices of convenience, if ghosts we rise like ghosts. If we collect, we collect like desire in a desert payphone, if we ring, if we ring like coins in the cup of night, if we lie like coins in the palm of Nebraska, if the sun is an argument with ghosts, if the sun's argument plays out in squares upon the floor of this home, if the day winds down like a watch, if heaven is a horology, if desire is the body we give the past, if at night termites tick like time in our bones, if in these bones we find the body's foreclosure. Two, if in foreclosure we find the math of our homes, if the math of our homes is the math of fire, if the math of fire is the math of money, if the math of money is a map of interstate rain, if grief is a cup, if grief is a cup, let me drink from it and be drunk. If drunk, if drunk and wandering, if thirsty and moneyed, if coined and fashionable, if drunk and wandering like a dog through the supermarkets of the night. If I want the question of a home. If I want as a windmill wants the wind. If I want that lesson, if I want the lesson that breaks me. If I want the desert and its wind. If I want to throw myself to it. If I want never to be seen again. If by the light of dentistry, my teeth anoint ledgers lavish with loss. If in these ledgers, every tooth is a house. If debt is a tooth, the dentist will not pull. Three, if awake, if waking, if awake in the wake of sleep, if sore-eyed and stubbled, if poorly fed yet feed, if coffeed and quiet, if humming, if awakened humming in the halls of convenience, if aching under the auspice of birds whose voices are feathered and vaulted and keyed, if of our voices we build a bank, will it not speak? If we atone, if we in our homes atone, if we sink alone into the chloroform fiduciary of home, if we pill and drone, if we alone are alone, if we tether ourselves to the stones of our homes, if we sink to lazier bones. 
if we believe bankruptcy is a throne, if along the rails the whistle no longer blows. Four, if we choose, if we had chosen, if we better, if we, if we had been, if we had been better and awake, if we had accounted, if we had awakened from the tax of sleep to the muted bells of bills that rang like fire in the foundries of past lovers, if love, if lovers and we sleep, if like fire we build the forest for overages, if for a surcharge we survive the past, if of the past, if of the past we make a ministry of the past, if we pass like fire over the waters of ambition, if upon those waters we find our faces and weep, if weeping stops, if stopping stops, if the ghost math of money stops, if named, if a name is cast like a coin over the auspices of convenience, if I call a name, will that name call back? If I call, will I call collect? If I collect like credit, if I credit a ghost? Five. If named for a ghost, if in the name of all ghosts, if the name is named that calls all ghosts to waking, if waking ghosts, if ghosts rise like desire for of sleep and dress for the newspaper dawn, if newspapered and awake, if hunted by convenience stores, if alone and named, if nameless and unknown, if anonymous as light, if mute as tax, if a dividend of sun sits like a loan upon the floor of this home, if silence is alone, if the sun is a school, if ghosts are a lesson drawn in sand, if the sun looms like a school of blood over subdivisions of ghosts, if subdivided, if the desert like a house of belief is a body dividended with blood. Six, if belief is a ghost, if blood is weather, if bones are birds in a body of fog, if debt is a body clothed with birds, if the body is a myth in the municipal pool, if birds gather like fists of cash on federal clotheslines, if ghosts tremble on foreign buildings like cups of fog, if cash is the myth, then the myth of collection of myth is a lesson in collective loss. If we are learned and lean, if we are lessened by learning, if learning is a lean to to loss, if a ghost is a home, if a ghost is a thing bankrupt of bone, if land is land only, if it is lessened in homes, if we like land grow green with the memory of our blood, if we grow and with land, if we be, if land is, if we be and with land, never let us be without, if never without us, our ghosts. Thank you very much. Wow. A little sip of water there. <laughs> I'm not going to trick or treat at your house on Halloween. I think that's what I found <laughs> out right there. There may you know, be I... <laughs> strange things coming out of the roof or something. Yeah. You, you never know. I was like, you know, books might be the safest thing to give now at, at Halloween. I don't know if the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Just yeah, drop, drop, drop a poem into my bag and I'll be good. There we go. That's it. <laughs> so, Adam, thank you. That was amazing. Oh, thank you. The poems are moving and the stories that accompany your poems are fantastic. I could, I could listen to your stories and your poems all day. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. yeah, you're really wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Um, I do want to open the floor to the audience for questions or comments, which um, you are welcome to use your voices or use the chat box. If you have some things you'd like to ask about or share, um, please feel free. And Adam is is Kerry related to you? Like she to is you? actually. She is the uh, she is the cowgirl in question right there. Oh boy. Uh, okay. We, okay. We, we we might want to see a video or something soon. So okay. Good. Good. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I've been I've, I've been fortunate in the uh, you know the the. The, I, I didn't quite get a book tour as such, but uh, one of the great benefits of, of Zoom and, and Zoom readings is that, uh, you know, no matter where uh, your friends or family are, they can still tune in. So uh, that's been a, a, a big, I think a huge blessing in, in this time is that I've been able to maybe connect with more people and, and have those near and dear to me uh, be able to, to partake. So it's been nice that way.
Yeah, no, it's it's uh, you know there are some Zoom benefits. I'm not sure how that that weighs on the scale of life, but uh, yeah, I told someone I was just going to do a phone call this week because I, I didn't want to like yeah. like over Zoom myself early in the week, so I was just <laughs> going to do a call. They they were like, yeah, it was like double thumbs up. Yeah. I mean, is, is there any greater pleasure now than just having a simple phone call? I mean, there, you know, where you, you don't have to, to focus on what you look like or you aren't confronted with your, uh, your, your digital avatar at all, at all hours. Yeah. That is the tricky part. That's it, yeah, yeah you know, I would, I would joke with my students that, you know, I, I ended up with facial dysmorphia just because I, you know, you, I don't know if Zoom is the best medium for, for ourselves, but you start to, when you when you realize that you're getting all your reactions in real time and you can see yourself always <laughs> working it starts to do something to your head so uh, have you you know do you maybe you could just tell us a little bit about you know maybe some writing assignments you give some of your students i think just with your you know variety of work there's, there's, there's probably some people that hear the assignment and they're trying to figure out you know how close they are maybe to the exit door or something or the window yeah. Well, you know, for me, I, I love anything that, that uh, deals in, in um, you know, kind of uh, constraints. I think, uh, table in for you. you know, like most, most poets, uh, you know, there is a kind of Houdini-like nature to it, right? You want to be, as a poet, I think you would want to be, you know, thrown into a, a trunk and then uh, padlocked in there and then thrown over a bridge into a river and then find your way out. So, um, you know, one exercise that I, I love to, to offer my students is, I, I didn't read the poem that, that I use that in in this, but uh, it's called a, a, a homophonic translation. And that's where you take a text written in a language that you cannot possibly understand. Um, so in this case, uh, I had a, I was presented with a poem written in, in Arabic and I do not speak or read Arabic. Um, and so your job is to then visually translate what you see on the page into English. And so as, you'll, as you can imagine with Arabic, I ended up with a lot of double consonants, um, uh, you know, just because it, it's such a, a graceful looking language and there are lots of J's and L's that appeared in there to me. Um, and so that's, that's why I ended up there as well. You know, I've done it in, um, I guess in, in ancient Greek, I've done it in, in Cyrillic is always an interesting one, Aramaic, uh, I guess, uh, Eritrean or Ethiopian text. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. So for me, it's just a question of, um, of finding materials that you can kind of repurpose. Um, another kind of version of that translation exercise is, um, is a negative image exercise where you take an existing poem written in a language you do understand. Um, in this case, the poem in the book is called Ghost of Polaroid, but the poem that I based it on is Banal Sojourn by Wallace Stevens. And for that, it's um, you're, you're basically writing the emotional uh, inverse of what you see on the page. So uh, like in, like a film negative, you know, how the, the colors are inverted. Um, so, you know, you don't want to be doing, if it says dog, you don't want to say cat, you know, you don't want to be that simple about it. Um, and it deals a little bit with maybe a, a kind of a, a Freudian analysis where you're, you're throwing out words and seeing what people respond to. But, you know, if someone puts down a telephone and your immediate response to that is swimming pool, well, then you're getting somewhere. And so you have a new kind of, uh, a new reversion of that poem. Um, so you're, you're kind of building on the uh, on previously existing texts in that way. So those are two kind of easy, uh, you know, do-it-yourself at home exercises that uh, that, that help. Um, you know, because for me, I think that um, I think we're all born with an innate sense of meter and rhythm and, a, and a, um, an innate love of language. I think most our earliest introduction to language is um, the language of um, our mothers. Uh, hearts and digestive systems in that way, right? Like when we're, when we're in utero, we're hearing uh, different pulses. And then of course, nursery rhymes are a way that many of us come to language and, and songs. Um, and so I think that uh, over the years, uh, school has a tendency to disabuse us of the magic and the, the potential in language for the sake of communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I like to remind my students that you know, language is really just a kind of inaccurate shorthand for the way that we feel. You know, my version of love is not their version of love or hate or uh, or, or enjoyment or anything else. These words, uh, you know, kind of like uh, money, um, have a, a, a theoretical value to them that we place on them. And um, they're approximations of what we feel. So our, our work as human beings, and, and particularly if you get into poetry as a poet, is to try and make that language as accurate to yourself and the world that you live in as possible.
No, great, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, thank you to our audience. I'll send you, Adam, a link to our YouTube Wonderful. recording yeah. of today's reading. Yeah. And. And I think uh, gratitude and and how impressed. And I think we have Larry next week, right, Larry? You do have me next week. Yes. Okay. Right. I'm 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 going to read up on my ghost literature, uh, rhyming, uh, whatever that rhyming harmonic, uh, get a harmonica. So I'm, I've got a lot of homework to do before next week. So. <laughs> and Larry's going okay. Take me off the schedule. <laughs> Oh, well, join us next week for more poetry. Um, and Adam, thank you. No, thanks your again, stories, Matt. your yeah. poems. John, thank you for hosting us today. And I wish all of you a happy Wednesday afternoon. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. <laughs>